Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the National Stock Assessment Science Seminar uh, series. My name is Bai Li. I coordinate this monthly seminar series highlighting interesting advances and topics in stock assessment science. Um, today, we have Dr. Lee Croning Fine with us. Lee received his uh, PhD in quantitative e ecology and uh, resource management from the University of Washington. He joined the Alaska Fishery Science Center as a research math medical statistician in June 2023. Um, during today's seminar, he will talk about how to evaluate scientific and uh, economic benefits of different service strategies through a management strategy evaluation for fisheries management in Alaska. Um, without further ado, I'll pass it over to Lee. Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to my talk. So as I'm assuming you are all aware, surveys provide a very important information that is used in fishery stock assessment models. Um, surveys provide a variety of different kind of data sets that include uh, biomass index, uh, composition data such as age, length, and age at length, and it also has the ability to collect unique data such as diet data. Surveys also have the additional benefit of being a data source that is independent from the fishery. Now, unfortunately, surveys are uh, costly to run. They require a lot of time and effort and also a lot of money. For this reason, there's been a lot of, there's been talks and considerations about how we could potentially run surveys in a more economical fashion. Now, things that have been considered to do this include uh, things like reducing, reducing the sampling effort. This could do be things such as um, reducing the number of hauls or decreasing the number of samples collected. Another thing that has been considered is instead of doing a survey every year, we do a survey every other year or every two years. And another option is to only sample specific areas each year and have those areas change up between years, thus reducing the overall effort done during the survey. Now, another, I would say, issue that, well, uh, not something other to be considered is that the surveys, the environment in which surveys collect data from are not stagnant and are constantly changing. And one of the uh, big drivers that causes change right now in our oceans is climate change. Now, there's a lot of things, ways that climate change can impact our fish species. Um, for this talk and for this project that I'm working on, we will be focusing on rain shifts. Um, how rain shifts worked is that as waters, the oceans get warmer, fish species tend to move towards colder waters by going towards the poles. So here we have an example of evidence of a rain shift occurring in Pacific cod. Now these figures show the density of catch in the Bering Sea um, for Pacific cod. The blacker the area, the more catch that is caught there. Now the left-hand side is for the catch collected in 2010 and the right-hand side is for the catch collected in 2018. And as you can see, in 2010, the majority of the catch was caught in the southern region of the Bering Sea, while in 2018, the catch has moved northward, thus evidence of a range shift. So with these things I just talked about in mind, kind of brings up to the question that's at the heart of our project, in that with these changing environments or the, you know, the changing environment caused by climate change, can we produce an economically feasible survey strategy that will still ensure that the data being collected captures the trends that occur in that environment? And this brings us to the goal of our project. Um, which is to evaluate the scientific and economic benefits of different survey strategies in the face of species range shifts through a closed loop simulation for fisheries in the Bering Sea of Alaska. 
Now, before I continue my talk, I just want to be upfront and let you all know that this work is not completed. Um, there's still a lot of construction going on in the model and things that need to be twerked a little bit or tweaked. So uh, for this talk, I'll be focusing on some unique characteristics of the model that we are using. And then uh, specifically, how do we model movement and how we calculate the projected get catch during our projection period of our model. And then I will finish our talk by talking about the kind of scenarios that our model is capable of looking at and the kind of diagnostics we'll be looking at to evaluate how our model performs. So the first thing I'll be talking about is movement in our model. And before I do that, I'm going to first talk about what kind of model we are using for this project. Now, for this project, we'll be using a manage management strategy evaluation, also known as an MSE. Now, I'm assuming that most of you here know what an MSE, MSE is. So uh, I'm just going to give kind of a brief overview of how it works. So an MSE is a type of model in which you have an operating model that generates data. That data is put into an assessment model, which then feeds into management, which makes managed decisions and feeds back into the operating model. And this cycle repeats multiple times into the future. And we want to see how our model, how this scenarios perform based on this model structure. Now, in our project, all MSE is divided in two parts. The first part is area specific, while the second is non-area specific. Now, as I just said, stated, our operating model is spatially explicit, and it was coded in RCPP, while assessment model, which is um, in stock synthesis, is non-spatially explicit. Now, the intention here in our work is to apply this MSC structure to a variety of different species and see how they perform. But for this talk and for all things shown further uh, in this talk, we'll be focusing on Pacific Cod. Now, the goal of, a, of, an, of an MSC is to have an operating model to generate data that is very similar to what has been seen by the assessment model in prior years. The intention to this is that when you go into the projection period and make changes to the operating model, it will produce data that would be similar to what you might expect the assessment to see going forward, thus making it a good study. Now, this besides provides a slight difficulty for us in that we have an operating model that's spatially explicit and an assessment model that isn't. So the data that we're using to tune our operating model so it produces information that's realistic is non-spatially explicit, which prevents, presents a challenge for us. So uh, as I go into that, I'm going to first describe how we deal with sp um, space in our operating model. So here we have an image of the Bering Sea. And as I stated earlier, we are focusing on the Bering Sea in our project. Now, our operating model is spatially explicit. So what we did is we took the Bering Sea and divided it into eight areas, um, labeled A through H. Now, in our operating model, we have two ways of dictating movement. The first is something called a dispersion matrix, which dictates how where an individual is, how where an individual moves from from the initial part of the year into um, to the end. It dictates how an individual moves from one point to the next each time step. In a dispersion matrix, the rows in, uh, indicate the initial uh, starting point, while the columns represent the ending starting point. Um, this is a visual representation of a disposal matrix, and some unique characteristics of a disposal matrix are that the rows need to sum to one. The idea is that an individual needs to go somewhere after the end of the year, while the columns do not need to sum to one. The other way we uh, model movement in our operating model is to change up the recruitment distribu distributions to each area. 
So in this visual representation, we have recruitments evenly distri distributed among all eight areas, but we can alter that if we want to. Now, if we took the parameter values from the original assessment model for Pacific Cod and put it into our operating model and looked at just the overall performance and not the area specific performance of our operating model, we can see that our operating model fits um, the expected behavior pretty well. So here we have two figures. Um, on the left hand side is biomass and the red line is what is produced from our operating model while the blue line is what is observed or predicted by our assessment models for Pacific Cod and the expected biomass over time. And as you can see, we, would, we want our red line to be as close to the blue line. And as you can see, it's a pretty good fit. Now the right-hand figure is a very similar plot, but it's for the spawning stock biomass. We have the same desire where we want the red line to be pretty much overlapping the blue. Once again, it's a pretty good fit. So we're feeling good about that. However, when we start looking at area specific um, outputs from our operating model, we don't see such as good of a fit. Now here we have um, the proportion at age by area over the years, where the columns are the eight different areas and the rows are the years. The black bars are the proportions at age generated by our operating model, and the blue bars are the observed uh, proportions at age in the assessment. Now, you might be wondering right now, as I kept saying, that our assessment model is non-spatially explicit, which make so how are we able to have uh, observations that are spatially explicit when the actual data isn't? So what we did is we used VAS to help predict what the observed proportions at age would be divided up between each area, and we use that to measure up to what is generated from our operating model. So there's a lot of information here, but the desired goal is you want those red bars to match up to the blue bars. And as you can see, they don't very well. And you can really see this specifically in areas A, G, and H. And to get in a better idea of what I'm talking about, we can take a closer look at those three areas. And as you can see, we have that uh, the proportions at a, or the portions at age from the operating model, which are the red bars, are shifted more to the left, while the observed proportions at age, which are the blue bars, are shifted more to the right. This means that our operating model is saying there are more um, younger age individuals in areas G a, G, and H, while the observed assess or the actual data is saying that they should be older. So we did a lot and made a lot of changes in our operating model to try to adjust this problem. And we weren't really able to figure it out until we looked at this figure. Now this figure shows the proportion at age by area normalized to sum to one and this is over the over the years, I think 2000 to 2016. This is that's a lot. Um, each figure, each panel you see here represents a different age. Where the upper left hand corner are age zeros, the bottom is age 12s, and the ages are red left to right. Um, the y axis is the proportions, and the x axis is the years. Now. There's a lot of data here and there's a lot of information. So to help understand how to read this, I'm going to focus in on the age one individuals and show you how you could read that specific panel. So once again, this is the proportion at age by area normalized to some to one in a year over the years 2000 to 2016. The y-axis is the proportions, the x-axis is the years. So as I said, this each, each bar represents the proportion of age one individuals in that year um, in each area. So how you read this or how you can interpret it is the bigger that each bar has a certain color, the more of those that age or age ones are in that area. So in this figure, what you see is that there's a lot of this aqua blue or aqua green color, which is the color that represents area E. And that's the biggest bar in all the bars. 
most of the time. This suggests that there's a large proportion of age one individuals in area E. So now that we have an idea how to read each panel, we could start talking about some general trends that we're observing from here. So we look at age zeros and age ones, what you see is that a majority of them are either in area E and D and not uh, in much other areas. Then when you look at ages two and three, areas B and F start becoming more prominent and while area D and E get a little bit smaller, thus suggesting that there's movement from area D and E to areas B and F. And then when you start looking at the rest of the ages, you start seeing area A starts becoming more prominent and some other areas as well, while areas D and E actually get smaller. So with this information, we were able to make modifications to how we dictate movement in our model. Specifically, we're able to adjust our disposal matrix and recru recruitment di distributions into what you see here. So in this, what these visuals represent is that Recruits are added only to areas C, D, and E, with the largest proportions of recruits going into area E. And the dispersal matrix, how that works, is that it forces recruitment, it, it requires, once you're in areas A, D, and C, it takes a couple of years for them to start propagating into other areas. So this is, you can see this visualization by that blue box I just highlighted, where you can see the initial areas of E and D, there's a large um, bright color, it's bright red for remaining in areas D and E, but you can slowly start moving into other areas like B, C, E, and F. Now, once you're out of those areas and you're in um, other areas such as A, B, F, G, and H, it's almost impossible to go back to the initial areas of D and E. And you can see that because when you look down by ending area of D and E, it's predominantly gray in those blue boxes, which means there's no fish going back there. What this does is it creates age specific movement without having a disposal matrix for each age group. So to see whether or not this works, we took this modified um, dispersal matrix and recruitment distributions, putting into our operating model, and what we got is an overall better result, where once again, this is very similar to the plot I showed a couple slides back that shows the proportion of age in each area over the years. The desired goal here is we want those red blocks, which represents the operating model, to match up to the blue box, which is what we actually observe. And I'm sure you all remember what it used to look like, but for myself, I have trouble remembering. So what I do to help kind of bring the point home is I'm going to flip back and forth a couple of times um, between what the new disposal matrix is and this is what the old one is. And what you can see is that those red um, bars are sh shifting over and matching up more closely with the blue bars, which is what we want to see. Now. To get a, once again, closer idea, a better visual of it, as I said before, a couple slides back, that this was more most pronounced in areas A, G, and H. So if we take a closer look at it, and we can see this is what we have from the new disposal matrix, and we then show the old information. Once again, you can see that we have a much better fit of the propor uh, proportions at age in those areas. So I'm just going to toggle a couple of times to kind of bring that point home. So based on this work, we now feel much more confident that our operating model is able to generate more realistic data and information that we can feed into our assessment. And thus, when we go into the projection period, we can have something that's somewhat more realistic. The next thing I'll be talking about is how we calculated the projected catch. Now, to start this off, I'm going to go back to the, our slide that talks about the goal of our project. And if you remember, one thing I said is that we're going to look at the scientific and economic benefits of different survey strategies. Now, I'm about halfway through my talk, and I haven't mentioned economics at all. So in our project, we incorporated economics and in how we calculated our projected catch. And to understand how we do that, I'm going to first explain, I'm going to have to go into how catch is kind of calculated in our operating model. So I'm going to go into a little detail. 
So once again, we have an operating model that's spatially explicit, while our assessment model is not. So that means that the catch in the assessment model is also not spatially explicit. Now we want to produce a model that, or a project, uh, predictive model that we can use to predict what the catch will be during the projection period based on each area. So we need to take the historical catch and break it up into the area grid that we have. And we did that by putting all these little hexagonal grids in each of our areas. And then with that, we were able to determine the catch in each area. So each of these hexagonal grids represents catch. The darker red those grids are, the more catch that's caught in that little grid. And with that information, we can start determining the amount of catch in each area. So this figure is from 2010. So now we can now determine the catch in each area in 2010. And we can do it for all the years. So here's one for 2018. So with this information, we can uh, produce a time series of the catch and wait by area in all our areas. Now that we have this information, we can now predict, we can now build a predictive model to help predict what the catch will, will theoretically be during our projection period. Now, as I've said before, the goal here is to include some economic values when determining the catch during our projected period. So that implies that we want to have some predictive model that accounts for the economic value or the value of catching the, the fish versus the cost of the effort that it takes to get those fish. So when developing this predictive model, we came up with a variable called implicit price. Implicit price stands for the average distance traveled to area I divided by the biomass index in area I. Now to better understand what that means, I'm gonna go through an example that um, will explain how the implicit price of area B is calculated. So I'm gonna start this off by explaining how the average distance traveled is calculated. So say, so we have these arrows, which represents trips from different fleets um, from, the, from Dutch Harbor into area B to order the catch Pacific cod. Now, to get the average distance traveled, we just take the average of those areas and get the average distance traveled. Now, the idea behind implicit price is it represents the cost of getting fish in the area. So the higher your implicit price is, the higher cost it is to get this, the fish there, and thus it's not as valuable than to say fish in another area. So the further you have to travel, so in this variable of implicit price, the idea is the further you have to travel, the more it will cost to get those fish in that area. So it could be because um, for gas or effort and all this stuff, it's just more costly to get there. So our distance is kind of a representation of the cost to get the fish. Now the denominator in our implicit price variable is the biomass index in area B. And the idea here is that as you, if the biomass in that area increases, the implicit price gets lower. Therefore, it's more desirable to catch fish in that area. So with these two things of average distance traveled and biomass index, we have a uh, variable that we can use to try to predict the catch during the, in the future or during the projection period. Now, just, I've got to say one thing is that the idea with the biomass index being our denominator is it's kind of a proxy for fisherman knowledge is the idea because fishermen tend to have an idea where the fish are. So we're kind of using that as a proxy as a way of being like, hey, we know there's more fish probably here. Therefore, we're going to go fish there. So that is the intention of why we use biomass index as our denominator. Now, the biomass in area B is not isolated. There are fish all over the Bering Sea, sorry, all, yeah, all over the Bering Sea, and they move throughout the year. Now, our operating model works on an annual time step. So movement only occurs once. The biomass index is just kind of a snapshot at one point of time in the Bering Sea, while the catch can occur at different times. So you can have fish moving between areas. 
So to kind of get an idea of what I'm talking about, we can have a situation where we have, this is the fish collected, uh, the information collected from the biomass index at one point. And I highlighted the fish uh, from to different colors to represent the areas where they're coming from. So that's, okay, we got our biomass index information, but the catch happens later on in the year or some other point in the year. So it's possible that fish have moved around and this is what the actual biomass distribution is during catch. So in order to account for that in our predictive model, the total catch in an area isn't solely dependent on the biomass in the area, in that specific area. So take area B, the predicted catch in area B doesn't solely depend on the biomass in area B, but also depends on the biomass in other areas and how those fish might move throughout the year. So with this, we were able to build a predictive model that was able to mirror what was historically seen in the catch in each area. So what we have here is a graph that shows the percent of total catch on the y-axis and the years on the x-axis. The black line is what is the true catch in each area, and the blue is what our predictive model predicted it would be. And we want them to overlap, which they do, so we're feeling pretty good. On top of that, we can also get the total catch as well. So once again, we feel confident that our predictive model does a good job predicting what catch historically was. Therefore, we feel good. We can use it during our projection period. So now that I've talked about um, some unique characteristics of our model, such as movement and how we used it to make sure that our operating model generates data very realistic to what we see in our assessment model. And now we have a projection. We can calculate projected catch using some economic principles in order to determine the catch during the projection period. I'm now, yeah, okay, sorry. I'm now gonna go, there's a couple other things from my goal slide I haven't talked about yet. And those are, the different survey strategies that we wanted to look at and the species range shifts and how we're planning to incorporate that. And these two things all kind of come together in the scenarios we'll be looking at. So for this, I'm gonna go into some detail about how, what our model is capable of doing and how we're planning to implement it. So first, I'll be talking about um, range shifts. So we'll be implementing them by changing up the dispersal matrix. And what I mean by that is here we have the dispersal matrix that we use that is able to match up to what was done historically in our population. Now, as we go further into the future during our projection period, we're assuming that due to global warming, the population is gonna start shifting more northerly into a northern direction. Now, in order to simulate that, at some point in the projection period, we're going to alter the dispersal matrix from what you see here to something that looks like this. Um, what you see is that areas B and C become are getting are got a lot darker, which means more movement is occurring into that area, while areas G, F, and E have gotten lighter, which means there's less movement there, thus simulating a northward, north, northern direction movement or a rain shift. As for the survey scenarios, um, I'm going to take a little time explain what how our operating model can simulate different survey scenarios and what we're capable of looking at. Now here are the eight areas that you've seen multiple times um, of how we divided up the northern uh, the Bering Sea. So the Bering Sea has three surveys. Um, we have the slope, which is the yellow shaded region. The shelf, which is all the red, and uh, surveying the northern Bering Sea, which is the blue region. Now, our operating model can change up how the survey is designed in a variety of different ways. One thing we can play with is when the survey is conducted. So we have the flexibility in where we can have situations or scenarios in which uh, the slope is not surveyed at all, or an area is not surveyed. So in this example you see here, the slope is not surveyed. The shelf is surveyed every year, while the Northern Bering Sea is surveyed every odd year or every other year. Now we can change this up. We can make it every two years or have the shelf being surveyed every other year. We can change up all these kind of dynamics, but the operating model, will, operating model is capable of doing this. 
The other thing we could do is play with effort. And we can do this by having scenarios where, say, the northern Bering Sea is not surveyed at all, the slope is only partially surveyed, and the shelf is fully surveyed. And what I mean by this is we can change up two characteristics of the data generated from those areas. The one is the biomass index, specifically the CV of the biomass index. The idea is that if it's only, if there's reduced effort, the, you, can, you can increase the CV, and thus there's less precision on the biomass index, and thus more variability, um, representing less effort. The other thing we can do is change up the effective sample size used to generate the data in each area. So those are two ways of impacting the effort of within the survey. So with these options we have, here are the current scenarios we have and we'll plan to look at. Now, we are would love to hear any suggestions of, or if anyone thinks there are other things we should look at, but here's the ones we're currently considering, where we'll be having two range shift scenarios, one in where the movement stays the same, so there's no change in the disposal matrix into the future. And the other one is where at some point in the future, we change it into a disposal matrix with a more northward movement direction. As for the survey designs, the three we are considering is one in which there is annual sampling in the northern Bering Sea and shelf, and no sampling on the slope. Another one, we have annual sampling on the shelf and biennial sampling in the northern Bering Sea, but no sampling on the slope. And the third one, which is a little covered by my face, says um, annual sampling of the northern Bering Sea and shelf with reduced effort, which means a uh, larger CV on the biomass index and smaller effective sample sizes and no sampling on the slope. Now we're planning to evaluate performance of each scenario by looking at how often a population is overfished, how often the population has over, uh, how often overfishing occurs to the population. We also plan to look at the fisheries economic value, such as taking the catch and multiplying it by an average X vessel price, and also look at the variability of the catch over time. These are only some of the metrics we're considering. Um, we would love to hear if anyone has any other suggestions of uh, other performance metrics that I think that might be more informative or something we should also be considering as well. And with that, I uh, would like to take any questions. Okay, this first question from Michelle asks, would a metric related to survey cost slash ship time be useful? Um, I definitely uh, would be useful. It's just there's a limitation of how our operating model is um, built. So there's a lot of different components towards it, and we're kind of assuming instantaneous uh, surveying. So it's, that's how it's collected. So there's a lot more about the information of the survey instead of the actual uh, cost of running it. So we're, the economic aspect we're focusing on is more the economic value of the fishery instead of the actual cost of running the survey. I do think that would be beneficial, and but unfortunately, I think that's beyond the scope of what uh, the intended focus of our project. And even though there's a lot of additional things we would love to include, we want to try to keep it a little narrow at this initial point and consider it something going on in uh, future work. Thank you. Uh, actually, we got a question in our chat from Andrew, which who asks, is there more value in sampling areas with higher variability, which often occurs in more marginal areas, instead of assigning value as relative biomass in each area. Let me think about this for a minute. Is there more value in sampling areas with high variability, which often occurs? So you're, from what I understand with this question, you want to look at with areas where there's more variability over the years, is it more worth going there considering this? Um, I would say that kind of, um, there. Uh, I would go with more, the intention of that is to kind of have more intended thought between each year of sampling 
and to kind of uh, go through a simulation that could explore that possibility in that. Once again, the way we have our model is we're kind of setting up a server design into the future and letting it run. So we're not tracking or making those changes to the server design within a scenario. I definitely think it's worth considering um, as something to project going forward. Um, but it's, it's, it's a scenario that's worth uh, looking at. I just uh, Our current operating model doesn't have that capability. Um, to do that, because once I, once we set it, we kind of have leave our computer alone and let it run, and we haven't coded that option in there. But it's it's hard to say also in the in the aspect of range shifts because if you focus more on ones with high variability, you were assuming our population is moving, and we're trying to capture that, and we want to know whether it can. And so I'm a little, I would say, concerned about if you focus on ones that show historical variability, you might miss things and other ones. So going into that degree of focus might cause, I would, might potentially cause more issues. Thank you. We have another question from Jason who asks, any thoughts on how to incorporate bycatch avoidance measures in the cost model? So the the model was, con so I work with a group of a variety of people and uh, we have an economist in our group and he developed the predictive model. Um, I do, this bycatch is an issue and something to be considered, but let me think about this. Incorporate bycatch avoidance measures in the cost model. We're, the bycatch can come into a variety of different uh, factors, and I think there's a level of complexity with including that that I do think is beyond the scope of this model. Um, what we're looking at at this moment is the economic value of what is caught, and we're assuming it's kind of a single fishery. If we have a multi-species uh, model where you have bycatch, where you might potentially catch more in there and cause another fishery to be closed, it's definitely worth exploring. but <laughs> I think it's a little bit beyond the scope, um, and I'm trying to think how you would incorporate it because having the issue with that kind of model is you want flexibility while also incorporating some degree of economic aspect towards it. So adding that the level, level of complexity, you start going into a multi-species model, which is a little bit beyond the scope of this, but it's an interesting question and definitely something I think worth looking into, but I think it's a little bit beyond the scope. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Kelsey, who asks, have you thought about running your model results through IMPLAN to measure economic impacts under differing model scenarios? Uh, unfortunately, Kelsey, I don't know what IMPLAN is. Uh, I, I, I unfortunately just don't know what that is, so I, I can't answer that question very well. Uh, I'm going to take a note of that and look into it. I'm going to write that down, but I unfortunately just don't know what that is. I'm sending the questions to you too, so we can always answer these offline. Um, we did get another question from Ian who put this in the chat and Ian asks, the project looks amazing. Once you finish this work for the Bering Sea, can AFSC provide you enough time to generalize the analysis and apply it to all the other regions around the country? Great question. Uh, yes, thank you for that question, Ian. And the short answer is yes. The goal of this model is to make it very uh, generic. So even though we're focusing on the Bering Sea, it can be adapted for different areas. There's uh, very little in it that makes it have to be that area. So the intention is to have this as a tool to expand into other kind of research questions that it could potentially answer. Excellent. And, and to follow up, Kelsey, thank you for responding. She says, uh, sorry, it's just a program that measures economic impacts. Um, I, this is my first project in where I'm including economics in it. And I unfortunately have relied a lot on the economic person and our team to work on that. So I will, I'm going to probably take a further look into it and see what it does and have a better understanding of it. All right. Thank you for all these questions, everybody. Um, Brian asks, Hi Lee, have you considered adjusting survey effort to match the presumed northward movement? The current survey effort scenarios seem to be unrelated to that movement. 
I may have missed it, but NBS seemed to switch to less coverage. So I have not considered, but I think this is a really good and interesting idea about changing this. And I would like that is something I would like to consider. So we're trying to stay within the range of the tournament survey designs that exist. But I, I think this is a great thing to consider. Um, yeah, uh, basically, no, I haven't. And I appreciate the question. And I will further the consider going forward. How about this question? Um, this is from Patrick and asks, given that NIMS is being challenged with resource limitations, is it worth considering an every other year survey design in addition to the various annual designs? Definitely. Um, so the, uh, the scenarios I talked about were kind of just demonstrating the capability of what the model can do. Um, Every other year scenarios are definitely things to be considered, and we are have full intention of exploring it. Th those three are the ones we have at the moment, and you're gonna. It's a, a series of six things with a lot of run calls, so that's kind of our baseline. But definitely, we want to continue to explore uh, more options, especially the every other year scenarios. Thank you. Uh, this question from Robert has asks, "How do you plan to evaluate metrics of the accuracy of the non-spatial assessment?" <sighs> Okay, how do you plan to, I mean, I get the question. Um, well, we're gonna look at the overall, the even our operating model is, uh, what should we call it? Uh, spatially explicit, it, we can combine those to get an overall uh, value of the total between the area. So we can see how well our assessment model actually matches up to what is actually produced to the operating model. So it's much easier to take a spatially explicit and see how well it estimates bio, uh, the assessment model estimates biomass. Let me rephrase that. An operating model that's spatially explicit, it's easier to take the, the outputs from it and make it, make it um, non-spatially explicit and then compare it to an assessment model that is non-spatially explicit instead of going the reverse way when you have an assessment model that is non-spatially explicit and tuning the operating model. So that's a it's a pretty straightforward, I would say, thing to do. And so we can look at how well it estimates biomass, uh, how well does it uh, capture recruitment variability, all those kind of things. So yes, uh, we plan to do that and look at the overall performance of our assessment model. 